Twelve years ago, as a new millennium beckoned, I travelled across Britain to meet people in some of the country's most hard-pressed communities. These were the early years of Blair's Britain. A new dawn has broken, has it not? And for most of us, the official story was of hope. It was the longest boom in British history. No return to Tory boom and bust. But my journey took me into another Britain. To places that seemed forgotten in the new age of prosperity. Among people who felt they belonged to another nation. Talked about by politicians, but whose own voices were rarely heard. It's soul destroying. I mean, there's really no other alternative to it. It, is, it destroys you. And they would turn out to be some of the most powerful voices I'd ever encountered. I'm no a pawn and I'm no a number. I'm a man, I'm a human being, and they will never, ever take my dignity from me. In the 12 years since I made that journey, the world has been transformed. With Britain struggling to emerge from the deepest recession since the Second World War, I want to see how the people who made such an impression on me back then are coping today. Tonight, I'll be returning to the cities. In Glasgow, I'm going back to the shipyard workers who'd fought to stop decades of industrial decline and save their jobs. Twelve years on, I want to find out what's changed for the people and places that felt like part of a forgotten Britain. You don't worry that you're a dinosaur. Dinosaurs lived for 250 million years. <laughs> if it hadn't been for the meteor, the dinosaurs would still be running the world. So much has changed in the 12 years since I was last in Glasgow. It's difficult to believe looking up this river. And the last time I was here, it was like the life and the colour had drained out of the place. And if you look around me now, you've got you know, concrete and glass. Millions upon millions have been spent here and it's still going on. And I suppose the big question for me is, with all of this money and, and sort of changing the face of the place, what's happened to the people? that I knew then. Theirs was a story defined by the struggle for work. Britain was booming, but in the Glasgow district of Govan, unemployment was three times the national average. John Brown was one of the lucky few back then. He had a job in the Govan shipyard. And his passion for the right to work was absolute. Like his father and grandfather before him, John had worked in shipbuilding all his adult life, joining the yard as an apprentice welder, age 21. What I want in my life? I want a job, I want some money in my pocket at the end of the week, and I want my kids to get an education which means they can have a better life than me. Simple as that. Nothing more, nothing less. In its heyday, the yard employed over 9,000 workers from the local area of Govan. But like the rest of British manufacturing, the modern story of shipbuilding was of decline. By the millennium, the shipyard employed less than 1,400 men. When I arrived at the yard 12 years ago, it looked as if the remaining jobs were about to vanish. The Norwegian owners were quitting shipbuilding. John Brown, married with two small children, contemplated what was for him the abyss of life on benefits. I 
tossed and turned for nights on end, trying to wonder how I was going to get out of this problem. Uh, that was my greatest worry, was actually keeping a roof over my head. I mean, that's a basic right, that's a practical thing. How am I going to keep a roof over my head? How am I going to clothe my children? The Union campaigned and compromised. In a historic battle that went all the way to Downing Street, the yard was saved. But the price was several hundred redundancies. Amid the celebrations, John Brown learned his job was gone. Twelve years later, I've come back to see what's become of a man who believed so passionately in the dignity of work. John Brown. <laughs> Good to see you good again. Good to see you, man. Are you How are you? I'm good. Good to see you. How you doing? Oh, well, I'm well, well, Charlie, how are you? Nice to meet I'm you. How you doing? Good to see you. Can you Excellent. Come? Can you yeah. Fergal, this is yeah. my, my eldest son, Gavin. Oh. How are you? How you my doing? My youngest, Callum. Oh. How you doing, guys? What age are you now? 16 and 14. They were only wee when you first oh, well. were up oh, here. That's the one they really on the television then. I have a 16 year old son as well. Yeah, well, you'll know. <laughs> you'll know I'm good through this. <laughs> So anyway, this is the home, and how are you yourself? I'm not too bad. You're looking good though. I'm looking good and I feel good despite the interview in 12 years, uh, which has been eventful. So much has happened. I wanted to know how John and his family felt about what had happened back then. <laughs> God, no. Now don't laugh at any of this, right? <laughs> Take home pay and day shift, £200 a week. I mean, that's hardly an excessive wage, but it keeps my head above water. I can get a Chinese takeaway once a month and a couple of bottles of beer at the supermarket once a week. That's my treat. That's his luxury. So many people said to me that that was the line that really struck in their head. God, it's a luxury to get a Chinese takeaway once a month and a couple of bottles of beer. That's true. I'm only on £300 a week now. <laughs> so there you go. That's 12 years. John faced the prospect of finding work in a city which had lost over a third of its manufacturing jobs in the previous decade. First of all, let me say one thing. I'm one of the ones at the door on Friday. Uh, last night was an agony for me, and this is even worse. And. Uh, I'd just like to say in a personal way that's 17 years in here, it's been a big part of my life, an important part of my life, and uh, I'll be sorry to leave you. I was, I was crumbling out of dust at that point inside. I just said it enough. One of our workmates killed his soldier in that campaign because he thought he was getting made redundant. John was on an emotional roller coaster. Then his fortunes took an unexpected turn. My manager just came over to me the other day and said, John, I speak to you. I went over to him and says, I says John, three guys have volunteered to take their redundancy and you've been chosen to be saved. I completely forgot that, mate. That's, I even know the guy who done that. Who took voluntary? Who took voluntary and saved my job. Where else would you get that but in a working class community? I'm going to take my redundancy and help somebody else in doing it. <laughs> it's incredible. And that's what ordinary people do when they're in that sort of situation. We're hopefully going to get a future. I think that that's a tremendous achievement. It's a victory, but it's a victory being won at a cost. And I, for one, I'll not forget the cost. Watching it all these years later, but what did you think? I used to be much older then, I'm younger than that now. <laughs> Bob Dylan, Bob my back Dylan. pages. <laughs> Seriously? like <laughs> 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 hey. What a roller coaster. It was hellish. That time it was absolutely hellish. It was like getting punched in the face, right? That's what it was like, I've been punched in the face, so I know what I'm talking about. It was like getting punched in the face and then getting a bucket of ice cold water thrown on you and then somebody giving you a cheque for £100. It was extraordinary. It was unbelievable. I mean, I was 15 minutes for going out the door and then 
bang, somebody's right, you can stay. John's job had been saved on that day. And the yard had survived too, for then at least. Men like John and his colleagues who'd fought to keep the shipyard open knew what lay on the other side of the gates. The Govan of 12 years ago was one of Britain's poorest areas, devastated by the nation's industrial decline. Without the 60,000 jobs that the shipyards on the River Clyde had once offered, work was scarce. Sort of wondering what it is like, you know, day after day after day, year after year, to go without work. <laughs> it's soul destroying. I mean, there's really no other alternative to it. It, is, it destroys you. Davy McCoosh was one of Govan's unemployed. The son of a shipyard worker. When I met Davy, he'd been out of work for five years after a succession of part time jobs. Davy had three small children and struggled to feed and clothe them on benefits. What do you feel as a man being unable to provide for your family? <laughs> Pretty disgusted. I look at my family and I think, uh, why? Why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? Why can't they have better things? Why can't they have a decent meal rather than frozen pre-packed? Davy was the first man in his family to live on benefits. He was only 39, but spoke like someone who'd long outlived his purpose. You just become a total degenerate. You're nothing in the community. You're not even a number anymore. You're a barcode. The last time I saw Davy, I never forget what he said. He says, you're not a human being, you're a number, you're not even a number, you're a barcode. And I don't think I've ever met anyone anywhere who just really got across to me the humiliation of being long-term unemployed. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> long Bye. time no see. Jeepers. How are you? How are you, man? Great Not bad. See. I'll get you in the wee set once I get these barriers done. Okay. So how is it you're not a customer here? I'm mm, afraid not. What are you I doing? I wish I was. You're working here? <laughs> yes, I'm working here now. Fantastic. And you come back. You know what, I'll tell you this one, you haven't aged. Well, I can probably say the same about you. But no, it'd be fun though. I did put it no, in. Funny you know you're not the first person to remark <laughs> on that. <laughs> well, a seat? Have a seat. I'll take a seat and do that So this is, this is your place of work? It is, yeah. Because I suppose when I met you, with all due respect, you were prop yes. propping up the bar rather than working yes. behind it. Aye. I'm doing both now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But you're paying for the drink with money you earn yes. rather than benefit. Hard earned. Give me just a wee second. Right, go on. It's not everybody's cup of tea. Not everybody wants to be pouring pints. But a lot of people would say to me, aye, but you only earn peanuts walking behind a bar. So what? I'm earning. I'm comfortable in my job. It's really clear to me when I watch him moving around this bar that here's a man whose whole physical presence is different. You know, you're not a beaten dog. No. With all due respect, that's what you looked like the last time. Yep. And that's the way I felt. In fact, I felt actually lower than a beaten dog. However, now I know that I am somebody and I know that I'm capable of doing anything that I put my mind to. Davy's a changed man. And in some respects, so is Govan. They've done a really good job in the houses. What used to be a wee single end, or, um, a wee two apartment, has now been knocked together and made into like three apartments with running hot water <laughs> and side toilets. Nearly £300 million has been spent trying to regenerate the area. And yet Govan is still one of the most deprived areas in Scotland. 
a quarter of business premises are still vacant here. The big truth about a place like Govan is that it needs jobs to keep it alive and to stop the corrosive effect unemployment can have on families who live here. When I last spoke to you, it was at your home. You don't live there anymore? No. Um, my wife and I uh, parted company. Not in the worst of terms, it's, but unemployment had a lot to do with it um, because it put a lot of strain in our relationship. Davy and his wife separated when his son Danny was seven. I think it was the stress of not being able to support them and not being able to give them what I felt they deserved. I felt as if I was letting them down constantly. I'd lost all faith in myself as a person. How did that play out in the relationship? It led to a lot of arguments, a lot of frustration, a lot of temper tantrums. In front of the children? No, very rarely. Um, I would try and avoid that. Sometimes it just got too hot that I couldn't stop myself from moaning and bawling and whatever. And they obviously picked up on that, so they would feel hurt. And that, I think, was a, the, the biggest downfall in my, my days then. The night? Was the hurt I could see in their faces. I'll see you in the morning. I was only a wee boy. I don't remember being sad all the time, but when I was in the house, I didn't like it. There was a few things that I did catch that I would like to forget at some point. Davy's son Danny was five years old when I last met him. His father was out of work for most of his childhood. What was he like then? Wasn't very nice, wasn't very happy at all, like, ever. I don't think I've even seen you smile up until I was about 11. I'm not disagreeing with that, because I wasn't a happy person. Was it wasn't a happy lifestyle. Angry, depressed. I don't want to embarrass you here, I'm just wondering when you hear that description I've, of what it was like. I've heard it that many times. Mm. Um, I can't deny that. It's, it's, a, it's been a part of me. Um, the, the sheer frustration and the anger inside me was... My family was an easy target. I couldn't get to the people I wanted to get, who were the employers who just ignored you completely. I hated you. Mm -hmm. But that all changed. What changed him? You clearly love him now, I can, you know, you can, you can feel that between you. Probably working, when he was working, he was always happier. He was always there. If he needed anything, he was willing to help. I think it's England again. You proud of him now? Aye, definitely. Yeah, it's me. I always smile. <laughs> It's one of the greatest things that any dad can hear is any of their kids actually admitting that. Working doesn't just give you the satisfaction of having a job, it brings a lot of other things into, uh, into perspective and I think it improves your person. After years of being out of work, Davy took the job he could get. It wasn't glamorous or high paid, but it gave him back his self-respect and healed his relationship with his son, Danny. On my journey across Britain 12 years ago, it wasn't just Govan where I'd found families caught in the crisis caused by long-term unemployment. From Leeds to Govan, this is a story about work and the struggle for self-respect.
drained, I'm exhausted, I've been through the ringer, but uh, I'm just glad I've got a job and a place I like working with people that I like working with and I'll put all this behind me. John Brown and his friends seem to have won a great battle at the shipyard 12 years ago. In their fight to save the yard, the men embodied the centuries-old motto of Govan. Without work, there is nothing. But what had happened to the shipyard itself since I last visited? Back then, the yard had been granted what I thought was probably a stay of execution. In a Britain where heavy industry was dying, where would the orders come from to guarantee a longer-term future? What none of us could have imagined back then was how global events would reverberate here in Govan. The Royal Navy wanted ultra-modern ships to operate alongside the US Navy in conflict zones across the world. Under new owners, BAE Systems, there were orders for six new high-tech destroyers. And then the biggest contract in naval history, two colossal aircraft carriers. It's absolutely awesome. When I was last here 12 years ago, the idea that they would be working on this Leviathan was just, it wasn't on the cards, staying open and, and getting by with whatever kind of small scale shipping work you could get uh, was the idea. And then along came defense. If it wasn't for defense, this place would have been sunk. It is a sight beyond the hopes of the man who led the workers back from the brink of disaster 12 years ago. Back in 1999, Jamie Webster was the union convener of the shipyard. He was also one of the most determined men I'd ever met. We are the best, and that's the, the conviction that we've had each other. Jamie is still the union leader here. That's the big block from the aircraft carrier. We can just see it there, look, yeah. poking out. Yes, that, that, a mighty size. That's a very minuscule part of it, right back to the end of the tank shop. When, when that comes out, it'll be a frightening sight. Awesome. We build really good ships in the Clyde. Indeed, I'd say we, we build the best ships in the Clyde. That's why they call it Clyde Built. But for John Brown, who fought so hard to save the yard, there was a cruel blow. In 2002, two years after I last filmed here, despite the new contracts, nearly 150 men, including John, lost their jobs. When they actually did pay me off, in a way there was a finality about that. That was, thank Christ, that's the end of that nightmare. Of course, little did I know what another one was about to unfold, actually trying to find a job. John went on a succession of government retraining schemes. From proud worker to a man on benefit. John was out of work for a year. The big man from the shipyard eventually got work as a teaching assistant in a class full of ten-year-olds. John told me how his days out of work challenged his identity. What did it do to you psychologically to be out of work? It broke the major plank, the arc that made up my edifice of my personality. It smashed the arch. It was very difficult to rebuild it. Were you depressed during that period? Yes. Yes, I was. How but did that manifest itself? 
bit quieter, a bit more withdrawn. But bad he, temper. Did you give me any trouble? Uh, yes. I didn't want you to bring that into the family yeah. home. Yeah. Thanks, at least in part, or a large part to Charlotte. I didn't give in to it. I couldn't afford to give in to it. If I if I had sat in the back of a darkened room and threw a towel over my, my head and cried myself to sleep every night, nothing would have changed. I'd have become a victim, and I am absolutely determined that I don't become a victim. But John's life would take another extraordinary turn. One day, there was a phone call. When BAE Systems rang you up and said, come back to work, what was your reaction? <laughs> Apart from trying to hold in a laugh, uh, what I thought was basically, they must have had a list, right? and I have been at the bottom of that list. And because they didn't have enough skilled workers, they have been forced to call me back. So it must have been pretty difficult for them to phone up the guy who was the biggest pain in the arse they'd ever had. When you walked back in through that gate, what did you feel? It was like pulling on an old pair of drawers. It was just like that. It's as if I'd never been away from the place. <laughs> that seriously, that's what it was like. The same smells, the same noises, the same patter, the same sights. Everything was exactly the same. I can't have to say to myself, have I actually been out here for two years? Today, after being made redundant, then rehired by BAE Systems, John is still at the shipyard, working on the giant aircraft carrier. Well, welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> what a world it is. John now works in a quieter part of the yard and needs to take regular breaks because four years ago he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, a disease of the nervous system. This area where you're working, what's it called? It's the Steel Outfit Shop, SOS. It has a number of other names. Like what? Tetch uh, Corner and uh, the best one, Cripple Creek. Tetch <laughs> Corner, why? Uh, there's a lot of guys in here with various different restrictions due to health or accidents or getting back to work after a period of illness. It's a community! I get a bit of feedback, I get constantly slagged, I get provoked. What do they slag you about? Uh, having MS and being a pain in the arse and useless. Really? Aye. Uh, you you uh, take that? Of course I do. I mean, there was a thing like, you know how MS can be quite debilitating, right? The boys know that as well, so they do things like put my chair in a puddle and kid on I've wet myself. Right. John jokes about his illness, but his last relapse left him unable to work for a month with a paralysed shoulder. Do you find yourself getting more tired more easily nowadays? Yeah, about two o'clock in the afternoon, half past two, I, I caught the brick wall, but I just absolutely bang into it. And after that, I'm really, I'm really flying on fumes to tell you the truth to the end of the shift. That's one of the reasons I've had to give up one day a week uh, and only work four days a week. I'm clinging on in here with my fingertips and I'll do it till I can't do it anymore. What do I want in my life? I want a job, I want some money in my pocket at the end of the week, and I want my kids to get an education which means they can have a better life than me. Simple as that. Nothing more, nothing less. John is one of the last of a generation who entered the workplace believing in the idea of a job for life. For many beyond the shipyard gates, getting even a start in employment nowadays is proving difficult. Last month, Scotland's jobless total fell by 12,000, but youth unemployment remains stubbornly high, with around one in five young Scots currently jobless. 
When Davy McCoosh went looking for work, he had no qualifications and spent years on the dole. A decade later, his son Danny left school at 16 without passing any exams. Two years on, Danny still has no job. When you were growing up along this river, there was the dream for you of following your father into the shipyards. Yeah. Now, it didn't work out. Uh-huh. I'm just wondering what dream there is for Danny, your son. Honestly. When all that industry is gone, what is there for Danny to aspire to? I'm sure there must be something for him. There must be. He's just got to find that niche and grab hold of it. And hopefully he'll find it soon. I really sense that you're worried this boy is going to drift and drift and end up like you were. I'm not letting him go until I know that he's absolutely bang on. It is strange. I do miss him, but you got to cut the apron strings at some point. Danny has moved out of Govan to live in Falkirk, 30 miles away. Davy's still keeping an eye on him. He's no 100 million miles away, so he knows that I'm still there if he, if he needs to get a hold of me. I'm only a phone call away. The local authority has given Danny a flat he shares with his girlfriend Louise, who's also unemployed. Davy's visiting Danny for the first time and has brought him a housewarming gift of a new TV. It's all yours. Right, now let's see what you've got. Kitchen. It's quite a big kitchen. Gave us a brand new cooker, brand new fridge freezer. A uh, cupboard where we stick the tins and all that. So. That's all right. Brand new washing machine too. Cool. It's a two bedroom flat, far bigger than Danny expected. Mr. Catch. He's got a lovely wee place. People would die for this at my age, never mind his age. Materially, Danny seems to have everything he needs, but I wonder what he's doing to try and find a job. The horrible thing is I'm seeing the, the same thing happen to him as what happened to me, and that he's slowly but surely getting himself into a rut. I could do it. You won't let that happen to yourself? Oh, I certainly won't let that happen to him, because he won't be drowning. I'll be his life jacket if I need be. Um, there's no chance he's going down, not with him, and not without taking me well. Do you ever feel like grabbing him by the shoulders and saying, wake up, it's a recession out there? He's still a kid himself. Um, he's not fully motivated. I think he needs to focus and needs to know exactly what he wants. Danny says he's been looking for work for the last two years since he left school. As Britain begins to emerge from deep recession, the national employment picture is improving. But for those young people, like Danny, out of work for more than two years, it's a different story. Since the recession began, their number has soared. In Scotland, it's gone up fourfold in the last two years. When you think about being unemployed and signing on, what does it make you feel about yourself? It's pretty miserable, sort of soul-destroying in a way, just being unemployed because you've got nothing to do. You find yourself being really bored. You don't really have a reason to wake up. It's not a life for anybody. What are you trying to do now in terms of getting a job? Anything. I would take any job going about. I'm looking in the newspaper, for the first time I'm actually reading a newspaper. Uh, looking online, asking friends, asking my family, uh, going to the job centre, anything I can really. Not only are jobs scarce, but like so many young people in the area, Danny hasn't the qualifications to give him a strong chance. All the while, he's still on benefits. What are the financial facts of your life? How much do you get on benefit? We have a joint claim uh, for two weeks, it's £222.90. Uh, to feed two people, 
for the Belsh have to pay? See, people who pay tax in this country would look at someone in your position and say, why are we funding them? He's young, he's fit, he should be out doing something. Even if it's working in a fast food restaurant or it's cleaning hotel rooms. I'd be happy to do that, but they do why me. They don't even give you a shot. They're either no hiring or they want somebody more qualified. At the age of 18 your father didn't have a job. At the age of 18 you don't have a job. I wonder are you worried about turning out like him? There was no chance I'll ever turn out like him. Because I know what he was like and I know what it felt like to be on the other end of it. Danny grew up in a world of low expectations. I just don't know if he believes he can find a job. Or following such a deep recession, whether there will be jobs for young people like him to find. From April next year, Danny may face a drop in his benefits as the government's £18 billion worth of welfare cuts start to bite. Back in Govan, there's another twist in the story of John Brown and the shipyard. The government contracts that kept it open are coming to an end. David Cameron has said that difficult decisions have been made about Britain's defences. But this government has inherited a £38 billion black hole in our future defence plans. £5 billion of defence cuts and the debate over Scottish independence are creating a climate of deep uncertainty. Anxiety is spreading. The yard I'm concerned about. The problem we have in Govan is that we are now too specialised. We have one product range. We have only got one customer, the MOD. The MOD is getting the money and it won't have any money for the next 10 years. Darwin shows you, nature shows you, that it's the specialists that become extinct. It's the generalists that survive. We need to be more of a fox and less of a panda. I accept that, that our industry will be downsized. I think all realistic for back market people realise that. That's across the country and every no, nobody's immune from that, so we can't set ourselves saying that we are God's chosen people or something like that. I know better than to doubt the determination of Jamie Webster and the men of the Govan Yard. We rose to the ashes twelve years ago and have had twelve really good years and we're going through a bumpy ride again, and we'll come through that again as well. In this story of work in Britain, few have more experience of the precarious fortunes of industry than John Brown. John's a complicated man, both intensely realistic and irrepressibly romantic. As a person, he's wonderfully unchanged by the passing of the years. I've enjoyed the struggle. I've made a lot of good friends during the struggle and along the way. I intend to keep that struggle going as long as I'm able. I love my class and I fight for them all the time. And I think I always will. But isn't it a fact your doctor has told you that if you keep doing this, you're shortening your life expectancy. Yes, it is a fact. Yeah. If that's the case, why do you keep doing it? Family look after Fergal. I've got two boys who are teenagers. Two boys that are teenagers that have done a short space of time will not be in school. They need money in the house to keep a family. This day, you'll know yourself, you don't live in fresh air, Fergal. The Govan shipyard has had the best years of John Brown's life. But I worry about his and the yard's future. It's late autumn 
and a great section of the aircraft carrier is being readied to leave Govan. It is, for a few moments at least, possible to imagine this place as it was when British shipyards dominated the world. The last time that I left Govan, there was in the yard, you know, a real positive sense of the future. And it's different now. There's a great deal of political uncertainty about independence in Scotland, recession. This yard doesn't know if it's going to get more defence contracts. And so when I'm thinking of Jamie Webster and John Brown, of Davy McCooish, his son Danny, all the people of Govan, I think these are not encouraging times. And yet, for all that, it's possible to leave Govan feeling quietly inspired by people who don't give up. It's the story of my entire journey, from the struggle for work in urban Britain to the rural areas where tenant farmers fight to keep their way of life. They keep going, not because politicians tell them to, or just because it's what their financial circumstances demand. There is something more hopeful here. A story of a resilient Britain where the deeper claims of family and community are not at all forgotten, but far stronger than I'd ever expected. Oh, 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 oh,